Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at this HP 3400B RMS voltmeter. Now, I know what you're thinking. Where is all the multi gigahertz instrument that we typically work with? But don't worry, the next video review is on an instrument that works up to 50 gigahertz. That's 5.0. It's a fantastic piece of instrumentation. And we're going to do some really interesting experiments with it. But for now, let's focus on this one. And I promise you, it's not going to be boring. Even though it doesn't look like much, this instrument has some unique features that's going to be very helpful in the future videos. It obviously has an analog meter in the front and a range switch you can see. Now I want to upgrade this and add also functionality to it. Now its principal operation and schematics are very interesting on their own right. We're going to examine them, learn exactly how it works, so we can take advantage of what we know about it in order to modify it and add some neat features in it to make it more modern to fit in the lab. So let's get started. So on this channel, we've looked at power sensors in the past. In fact, we've looked at some that work up to tens of gigahertz. We take them all apart analyzed exactly how they work, as well as look at the circuits under the microscope. So we're really quite familiar with them. So here's an example of one. This is a 50 gigahertz power sensor. And you notice that it starts at 50 megahertz. So it has a very high frequency range, but its low cutoff frequency is only at 50 megahertz. That's because the input is AC coupled. And because it is AC coupled, you cannot put a very large DC voltage here because the capacitor is rated up to 50 gigahertz. And as a result, it has fairly small dimensions and low breakdown voltage. You can see that if you put more than 40 volt DC, you will permanently damage it. Now this one can go to minus 70 dBm, which is very, very good, but it only goes to minus 20 dBm. So it's really focused on the lower frequency, lower power ranges. Now you can go to uh, a little bit lower in frequency, and some things do improve in that situation. You can see this one goes down to 10 megahertz, maximum 18 gigahertz, and it works from minus 50 to plus 30. That's an 80 dB of dynamic range, which is very, very impressive. This is a USB based version uh, of a similar instrument here. So this one can only take 20 volt DC for a similar reason. So you cannot, for example, measure the noise of a power supply using these that puts out 50, 60 or 70 volts because you will destroy the input. Now you can get power sensors that actually go all the way down to DC. So you're an example of one. This is a Roden Schwartz one. It goes from DC to 18 gigahertz. It only works from minus 30 dBm to plus 20 dBm. Now you cannot put any DC voltage here. If you put anything large enough, you will destroy the input, which is 50 ohms. So the fact that these guys are 50 ohm, it also has a limitation because you cannot dissipate a lot of power in them. And even though this one goes down to DC, it doesn't quite meet some of the requirements. Or you could just go into a multimeter. Of course, you can always use a regular multimeter. And some good multimeters are true RMS, like this one is. And you can get really, really expensive ones that do direct sampling, basically doing everything in a digital domain. Even though these guys have a huge dynamic range, they are, do not have a very large bandwidth. So this one is only up to 100 kilohertz. Even very expensive multimeters, bench ones, can go maybe to a couple of hundred kilohertz. So 100 kilohertz is not enough to measure some noise of some switching power supplies, especially modern ones. They use very high frequency switch. So then, this is what makes this instrument so special. First of all, its input is AC coupled into high impedance, so you can put any termination load that you want here for different power handling. It works from 10 hertz all the way to 20 megahertz. It has exactly the right frequency range for the kind of work that we want to do, analyzing and reviewing, for example, power supplies and looking at noise in those uh, frequency ranges. It works from 1 millivolt RMS all the way to 300 volt, and which is a huge dynamic range in its own right. And then you can, of course, put a big, big DC voltage at its input up to about 600 volts. So it's really well protected. Now, there's absolutely no digital circuitry in here, at least not for the measurement side of it. It's done all in the analog domain, which itself is very interesting. So we're going to take a look at that and understand exactly how it works. And then, of course, upgrade it to make it more useful. Now, one other item worth mentioning is that this instrument also behaves really well for signals that have a high crest factor, signals that are very short, for example, in duration, and vary from their peak value to their average value. Those signals are generally difficult to measure the power of, and they're also difficult to, uh, for power amplifiers to work with because of exactly that kind of reason. So we're going to take a look at that as well, because crest factor does hurt a lot of these true RMS multimeters. The direct sampling ones are, in fact, boasting direct sampling because they can catch those very, very short events. But the architecture of this overcomes that. The 3400B unit that I bought from eBay was in fantastic shape, and not to mention it came even with its original manual, which is very unusual to get a hold of in its original form, of course. And it has all the information, and at the very end, it has the schematics. Man, I really wish things hadn't changed so much over the years, where you get this nice fold-out schematics of everything. So we're going to take a look at this and see how it works and take advantage of this.
So here's a block diagram of the HP 3400B. The HP 3400A, when it originally came out, was based on vacuum tubes, and eventually that design became a transistor solid state based one, and then eventually the 3400B perfects that and adds a lot of more integrated components to it. So we're going to take a look at this one, which is an evolution of that original one, which is quite nice to know. So here's the input, this is a BNC of course coming in, and looking in here we're seeing 10 mega ohm, and we're seeing an AC couple signal. So there is an input attenuator here, and this input attenuator obviously is going to make the signal smaller. But the problem is that it has to maintain a constant impedance of 10 mega ohm, and it has to be AC coupled. And you can't do that for all the ranges of attenuation it wants to achieve. So what they do is that they put it into an impedance con converter. And this impedance converter is really nothing more than a non-inverting unity gain amplifier. The benefit of it is that the impedance looking into it is very high, and the impedance on the other side is very low. So it means that it can now drive a post attenuator, which has a much smaller impedance without affecting the input impedance of the whole system. This is a very common thing, common technique, in order to be able to provide a high input impedance and then have some very high resistive or some other types of attenuation which we can take a look from the schematic. So once you're in this node over here, the advantage here is that you're only attenuating at this point, because this thing doesn't actually have any gain. So this attenuator can then make the signal smaller. It means that this wideband amplifier, which then finally follows after all of this, always operates with the same range of input signals and output signals. It means this dynamic range at the input and output is always the same. It makes this design much simpler. So you basically just constantly adjust its input to make sure it's small enough to not saturate it. And then that when there is no attenuation at all, that's when you're in your lowest range. Okay, so then signal coming out of this wideband amplifier is an AC signal, of course, because this whole thing is operating on AC. And this range is going to be from 10 hertz to 20 megahertz. Great. And then what they do with this is that they dump that into a resistive heater into some kind of a heating element, which means that that AC signal, the energy of that is going to get converted into thermal energy. It's going to become heat. So the more AC signal you drop into this, the more you're going to get uh, some kind of a heating effect, of course. Now you have to keep in mind how much attenuation you have here so you can scale it accordingly afterwards. Now what you could do on the other side of this heater is put a thermocouple and then measure the signal from the thermocouple and then say that's the amount of heat I'm dropping and that's proportional to the input power and therefore that's my total power. Yes, you can do that, but there are some challenges with doing it directly on this thermocouple. First of all, this is a nonlinear relationship. So you're going to have to undo that nonlinearity, which is difficult if you have no digital circuitry. It can be done, of course, but they didn't go in that route. The second problem is that this thermocouple on its own is going to be now very sensitive to any ambient form of temperature change because you cannot differentiate what's the ambient temperature and what's the temperature that you dropped in because of the heating element. The only way you can be sure is to totally isolate this from the outside so that the outside temperature changes cannot affect it. That becomes pretty difficult. So they don't do that. They do something much more clever, of course. They add a second thermocouple heating element combination and they thermally couple these two with each other perfectly. So they are completely tied to each other. Any temperature in here is basically kept constant. And then they take the signal of that. So now you have two heating elements and two thermocouples. And they take the signal of that and they essentially add two of them together. You can see that they are in series. And they take a signal out of that and they put it into a chopper amplifier. And this chopper amplifier modulates the signal and then converts it back into DC. They do this so that the drifts at DC are not affecting it. And then they take that and then they bring that over here and they take the output and put it into another heater. So this becomes kind of like a servo mechanism, meaning that the voltage in here, the DC voltage that's generated by the chopper amplifier, is going to go higher and higher until the thermal effect induced here and the thermal effect induced here become exactly the same because that's the only condition where the signal from this thermocouple perfectly cancels the signal from this thermocouple. Any difference between them, it means that the chopper amplifier is going to adjust its output in order to match them perfectly. This is of course simple but really smart because it has several main advantages. It doesn't have the nonlinearity, it's not susceptible to any kind of temperature variations of the environment, it's not susceptible to DC because of its chopper amplifier design configuration, and it also isolates the high voltage side coming from here to any of the low voltage sides coming from here.
So it does everything we want at the same time and it's done completely in the analog domain. At the same time, they put a low pass filter and output amplifier so that it can smooth out the signal so it can be very jittery. That's a nice averaging added. And then they take that and they move the needle with it. They also provide a DC signal that you can measure in the back of the instrument. And then that will tell you what the voltage is proportional to that as well. So if you want to connect it to an external multimeter, you can do that without having to use the needle. So that's the entire operation. There's, of course, more details in there somewhere, but the principle is beautiful, simple, and it works really well. So how do I want to improve and modify this instrument? Well, I want to add some digital capabilities to it. First of all, I want to add a USB port so we can connect it to the computer and look at this digital data and for logging it and connecting it to some GUI potentially. But I also want to add an LCD screen to it so we can see a whole bunch of these data digitally at the same time. For example, trends across time. I want to see the value of RMS and various DBM voltages and powers at the same time, like DBM 50 ohm, DBM 75 ohm, and 600 ohm, and so on. I also want to see the equivalent peak-to-peak -peak voltage as if the total measured power was a perfect sinusoid. These are very helpful to get at the same time. Of course, that means that you need to digitize things and have some kind of a microprocessor in there with a USB interface. Now, all of that sounds great, except for the fact that this is a really, really sensitive instrument, which means if you just drop in digital stuff in there, all the digital noise is going to swamp this wideband amplifier. And you're going to get all kind of erroneous results. And I ran into some of those problems during the design of this, and we'll talk about that as we do it. So what is the easiest way to do this? Well, the instrument does have a DC output voltage. We can just simply digitize that. And right away, there are some problems with that because this DC output is actually negative. It goes from minus one volts to zero. So first we have to flip it in order to make it more reasonable for you know typical A to D converters. We're going to use, let's say, a 12-bit or a 14-bit data converter. So we need some signal reconditioning. I also want to draw all the power from the instrument. I want this to be fully self-contained and plugged in as if it was done originally without using any other external power supply, which makes it itself quite challenging because you can inject noise back into the unit. So we're going to have to worry about all of that. There is one more complication. Remember that the range switch of this instrument is just this knob you turn. Yes, in fact, it's, we're lucky that it is calculated digitally inside, but not stored in any meaningful way. So we're going to have to spy on some internal lines to figure out what the range is set to. Otherwise, you don't know how to scale this DC voltage and show the appropriate result. This is all done analog in here, but we need it in a digital domain. So it's going to be really interesting. Let's take a look at a couple of the schematic areas, which is of interest, and see what we need to add. So the very first thing we need for our circuit is power from the power supplies. And here's, by the way, the input attenuator here. And this is not a very good scanned version of the service manual. I just found this online. Here's the impedance converter built around this transistor over here, which then goes on to the rest of the attenuation. But let's go over here and take a look at the power supply section, because that's where we're going to steal some power. From here, we have our transformer inputs. And then this thing generates three separate voltages, 27 volts, minus 15 volts, and VCC, which is 5 volts used for the digital stuff. Digital here is just like range switches and all the logic needed to turn various relays on and off for the range. It doesn't do anything else. So there are full bridge rectifiers over here and a much smaller re rectifier, not a full bridge one over here. There's a diode here that hasn't quite made it through the scan. So this is 5 volt supply. Now one of the very first things I want to do is I want to completely avoid taking anything after the LDOs because this gets closer and closer to the analog circuits. It's better for us to steal power right after the full bridge rectifiers. That's right where the signal already has a lot of noise on it because it has the line voltage AC line coming in 50 or 60 hertz on it. So we can steal it from there. Now I do want a plus 5 volt or a plus 9 volt and a minus 9 volt supply because I need to do the inversion of the negative voltage coming in. So I need a plus and minus power supply for the op amps. Now, I could take some from here, but if you look at this, this is 27 volts, which means the voltage in here is probably considerably higher, could be 40 volts, and then we're going to have to go from that all the way to 9 volts. That's a huge drop. We're going to burn a lot of power for no reason. So let's not touch this one, so forget about this one. The minus 15 one is already okay, which means this voltage is probably, you know, minus 20 volts or so. We can use this one to generate minus 9, and then this is going to be maybe 10 or 12 volts. We can use this to generate plus 9. And then from the plus 9, we can generate plus 5, which then goes into all the digital circuits. Okay, good. So that settles it. We're going to use this voltage over here and this voltage over here. Now next, we need to read the 
current range on the instrument. So we need to find out where the user has set the front knob. Now, very luckily, that turns out that's the only digital part of this entire instrument, actually. And there's a connector inside the unit, and that connector carries a couple of these signals, which are already pulled high with a series of resistors that control the whole bunch of NAND gates. And these NAND gates create a truth table, which is written over here. And this truth table has all the ranges and all the settings on those voltages, which then go into turn all these relays on and off. And these relays are the attenuation relays. So it's super convenient. It just happens that if we just spy on this cable and read these four bits of digital value, we will be able to find out which range we are on. That's exactly what we're going to do. This is just a ribbon cable inside of the instrument. We're going to tap onto it. And this connector even has the DC voltage and the meter voltage on it too. You can even take those voltages from there. So we have everything that we need to get started. We have the DC voltage, we have the, the range, and we have the power supply. Now you can even take this a step further. I'm not going to do this now, but there is another connector called a test connector. This is probably used in the factory for testing this instrument so that nobody has to be there turn the knob one at a time. That means that they can overwrite the current range sent by the front panel hard switches with some kind of a software controlled device. And these bits actually come over here and have the ability to overwrite using these NAND gates and the pull-up resistors the connections from the front panel. So that we can actually you know, control these two, and you can make an auto-ranging version of this instrument. I'm not going to bother with that today, but it's something that's definitely possible because all of these are easily accessible. And here's the main board of the instrument outside. It, this is really essentially the entire thing. Now, all the sensitive front end, so the signal coming over here, all the attenuation and various amplification stages are all encapsulated here, and the thermocouple transfer is done over here under this cage. Now we're not going to touch any of that because we want to stay away from all the sensitive signal flow there. We're going to focus our attention here in order to tap off from the raw voltages after the full bridge rectifiers on the different transformer taps. That's going to give us our plus and minus power supply, which we will then regulate again ourselves in order to get to the voltages we want. But putting anything on this side should have minimal effect over here. But that doesn't mean that you can just have wires running around because you can couple into this and it will throw everything off. And I ran into a lot of problems with that and I'll describe it as we go forward. So this is going to be a very simple addition. Just add two wires and move to the next step. All right, so here's the circuit that I'm going to put inside of the instrument to give it all the capabilities we are hoping to achieve here. So the very first thing I need to do is to convert the analog voltage that is generated into a positive voltage. And I'm going to also give it a gain of two. So the minus one voltage full scale becomes plus two volts using this circuit. There's a bit of complication here. So essentially I need an inverting amplifier. I'm going to use an op amp. That's not difficult at all, of course. But the issue is that the impedance looking into a, an inverting op amp configuration like this is equal to this very first resistor. Yes, because this node over here is essentially a virtual ground if the op amp has sufficiently high open loop gain, which these ones all do. So I have a 10 kilo ohm resistor potentiometer here, which I can adjust and bring it down to about 8K. And then this four and eight will create a gain of minus two. Now this is also good because I can calibrate the circuitry using this uh, to get the gain exactly where I want it. Now the reason this is a little bit of an issue is because this 4 kilo ohm resistor represents a load that this DC voltage from the instrument has to drive. Now the output impedance of this itself is a kilo ohm. So of course driving a kilo ohm into 4 is going to create a voltage divider and it's going to mess up later on wanting to use this for, let's say, with using an external digitizer. So to solve that, I have placed a non-inverting amplifier over here, which has a gain of one, it's just a buffer, and that way I will have a very high input impedance looking this way. Now you could increase these resistors to make them much, much larger, but then you run into offset problems because of the input leakages and so on. So I wanted to keep these values a little bit reasonable. This 500 ohm, ohm resistor here is just for protection in case something goes wrong and this gets shorted. And then I have a 1000 ohm resistor at the output here with a shot diode in reverse bias. This combination prevents this voltage that we want to connect to an ADC to actually become negative because you're not allowed to drive the input of the ADC for what I'm using below zero. So that's just all protection. So zero to minus one volt over here becomes zero to plus two volts over here. That's all the analog and they're running from plus and minus nine volt power supplies, which I'm getting from the unit as I described earlier. So here's our data converter. I'm using an ADS1115, which has an I2C interface directly connected to our microprocessor over here. And this has a, I believe it's a 12-bit data converter. It might be a 16-bit, I forget now. But it's whatever it is, it's more than enough for what we need. So we just connect this voltage over here. The, the rest of it is pretty straightforward. I2C, 5-volt supply. Now I ran into a very interesting and unusual problem. 
Now the range numbers that I mentioned, the range digital values, I was directly feeding first into the microcontroller. And remember that this instrument was designed with no digital activity in it at all. These are just essentially on and off switches and they don't have any dynamic behavior. And I no noticed that whatever internal noise these have, which is very, very small, was feeding back from these digital pins back into the main PCB and it was actually causing uh, some erroneous reading. So I looked at, you know, what, what can I do? I need to filter these. And I came up with a very simple solution based on what I had, uh, just components lying around. So what I decided to do was to buffer them. So I took the digital values coming from the instrument, put them through a 5 kilo ohm resistor, connected them to a Schmidt trigger IC, just a 74HC14 chipset that has many in it, but it has a six of them in there. And then I just took the output of those and then I connected them. So this creates some reverse isolation because of this 5 kilo ohm resistor as well as the fact that these devices are in the way. But that wasn't enough because even though there is some isolation, it was still picking back. So then I took the power supply of this chip and I put that through a 1 kilo ohm resistor and a 100 microfarad capacitor before actually putting it back into this chip. That really, really filtered everything out. Now normally this would never work if you want to have any dynamic behavior through these Schmidt trigger inverters your power supply is just going to go way down because as soon as you draw any current over this kilo ohm resistor you reduce your supply. But in this case it doesn't matter because these numbers are just static anyway. So this worked really well and it created sufficient isolation. So here's the voltages coming in from the board. This becomes plus and minus 9 volt. It's just the full bridge rectifier and voltage regulator. There's an additional voltage regulator over here, which then brings the 5 volt that we need to run this Arduino compatible board as well as our ADC board. Now I need to send us all this information out into some LCD screen. This was also pretty important. In order to avoid sending a lot of digital packets back and forth, I created a very simple RS-232 interface where I just send small packets of information which is just a digitized value and the range number and that's it or the overload condition and I just send that over a little simple four wire cable which I'm us using a stereo cable that way the amount of digital data that goes through some wires into the instrument is really minimized and the duration is really minimized and that helped again all these little subtleties I had to discover along the way I actually made three versions of this board before I figured out how to completely silence all the various noises and problems that it was having of course you can make a layout out of it here's the layout and then I used the CNC machine to carve that out and that was the board that goes inside of the unit now we also need a board that goes outside which is going to drive the LCD screen and here's the external LCD board. You can see that the data coming in over RS-232 is similarly fed into exactly the same microcontroller. So this technique is essentially the same as what every other manufacturer uses when they're making these instruments. They have the front panel completely separate. It has its own driver, its own LCD, its own operating system even. And that separates everything from the sensitive analog stuff and the front panel can be reused for many projects. And this is exactly the same. The digital data coming over here is fully interpreted by this and this guy is responsible for generating either GUI elements on the LCD screen and driving it and so on. It was going to run on battery as an option but I discovered that it's just not necessary. So that's it and you can also make a layout out of that. Very straightforward. Nothing really unusual. All the libraries for driving these kind of LCD screens are now so widely available uh, using an Arduino platform. That's what we're going to use. And then finally the rest is just writing code. Lots of little code to deal with how to manage the numbers, how to read the range values and then appropriately scale the analog values that are being read so that you're calculating the correct things. And on the left side, so this is the code that runs on the outside on the LCD screen and this is the code that runs inside of the unit and they're running on exactly the same microprocessor. This one is of course much much longer because it has all the drawing of the GUI elements which I will show you in just a second which I think it turned out quite nice. Again I'm not going to go through the code if you want I can leave it on the website so you can play around with it as well or replicate this project if you're interested. So now that's the fun part. Let's go take a look and see how it looks like. So here I'm trying to retrofit that PCB directly inside of the unit. I'll show you some of the other aspects of its design and the back of it in just a second, but you can see how it sits here. The main board will be up here, which is of course not right now, not inside of the instrument. So here's our dual regulator at the very top. That's where power supply is going to come in. Here's our A to D. Here are the two op amps that are going to recondition the signal from a negative voltage to a positive voltage with a gain of two. We have some decoupling capacitors, protection circuitry resistors that we saw. Here's where the analog voltage is going to go into the 
units right over here and underneath this PCB because it's on a standoff is where our processor is that's where the Arduino compatible processor is there and the USB port goes right underneath in there and I have put a piece of copper tape all around the stands to create a little bit of a Faraday cage underneath this so that at the top at the bottom and at the sides basically have ground that prevents the noise generated by all the activities inside the microprocessor to at least be confined as much as it can be and I'll show you a side view of this in just a second so it looks like it's going to fit nicely in the unit but there's a lot of testing to be done still so let's see how I ended up fitting everything inside of this unit and to get rid of some of the noise and injected unwanted signals into the actual instrument. So here's the board I just showed you. You can see here's the copper tape surrounding the microprocessor which is right underneath this rectifier board over here. So these voltages coming over here are actually DC but having some regulators over here further isolates everything because the kickback from it has to go through the LDO and that does help some of that as well. Everything's tied in as far away from this as possible. This is the cable that carries the signal to the LCD screen and the voltage to the outside. Everything's pushed back uh, to the back of the board and we have ferrite beads in various locations. This one at the bottom here is on the USB cable. That's going to be the PC interface and I put a, a, a one over here around where we monitor the digital signal and I talked about how I had to isolate that so that the noise doesn't get back to the instru instrument which was a quite a tricky thing to figure out. Now go over here you can see a little bit more of how that is fit in there and if I flip it upside down you can also see the bottom and the ferrite bits over there. Now if you look you can see that there's a couple of clamps over here I have ground clamps directly going to the ground of this board really bringing the ground as, as close as possible and giving a, a nice solid ground from all around to the back of this and I'll show you how that is connected too. And all of that techniques combined essentially removed I would say about 95% of all the noise this generates into this circuit. It doesn't really affect the performance by much but I did the best I could given the tools that I had here available to me. And here's the back of the board. You can see a couple of the experimentation I had to do here. Put some additional wires to figure out some of the noise issues and here are the four grounds coming in really protecting the back of this. And this little thing here to make sure that this doesn't touch the metallic side panel over there. But overall I think it's a nice fit and lucky that there's so much empty space here for this to actually fit in there. Let's take a look at the LCD module. And here is our little LCD screen, 3.2 inches and there's the Arduino compatible board underneath and the back of it of course with our ground power and serial interface. So really simple way of doing this. Now this is strategy is quite common as I described earlier bringing all the computation of the LCD onto this module and all the computation of the rest of the stuff, analog stuff, inside of the unit itself. Now the, all, all this needs is some kind of an enclosure. And so now at the back of the unit we have two additional interfaces. So here is our USB port which we can use to get the data out if you want to create a PC software for it as well as program the internal Arduino. And here we go. This is the interface that carries all the data out to the outside LCD screen. And this is just nothing more than like a headphone jack. I'm using just one of these guys. It's going to plug in there and it goes to the front where the LCD is. And here is the little module at the top. My brother actually 3D printed this for this project. And this sits on top and uses the same two screw mount points that used to be for the lid so it, nothing's actually modified and it sits there quite nicely and that cable is going to the back. Now we can play with it. So Pooch, are you excited to try out this new GUI and this new whole bunch of software that I've written? Oh yes, that's a crazy cat. Alright, here we go. So everything of course is powered together and coordinated together so I have a lot of information on that GUI that's displayed, we're going to take a look at it a little bit closer but as I change the range you can see that it detects the range at the very top so we know exactly what setting we're in without that you would not be able to interpret the data into the correct values you can read the analog voltage but you don't know how much that corresponds to the RMS value so let's take a closer look at the GUI and see what elements I have decided to include there so the GUI shows several different informations at the same time, all derived from the core RMS value that's being read. And that's shown over here. Now as you change the range, appropriate numbers and so on would have to be scaled so that it makes sense. Right now it says microvolts RMS because our range is in one millivolt RMS. As I change it, those numbers will change. All of that is written into the GUI and calculated. So one millivolt RMS, if it goes into 50 ohm, would be minus 47 dBm, and that's the full scale at the current setting, which is the smallest setting. We also can see what the dBm 50 ohm value, 75 ohm and 600 ohm would be. We also see how much power it is if it were into 50 ohm in actual watts. And then there's also a volt peak to peak value down here. Now this volt peak to peak value means that if the signal were a sinusoid, what would its peak to peak voltage be? 
this is now an, of course an integrating power detector so you can have many different tones and many different kinds of waveforms it just gives you a hint of what it would be if it was all in one sinusoid so that's what that's what it is now if i change it you can see that it takes a little bit of time for it to stabilize that's the normal behavior of the instrument itself and on the left side we have a graph that shows the trend over time so you can see how that's changing that's very useful something that of course you cannot do with a needle and then at the very top over here, we have a bar that goes back and forth depending on where you are on the full scale. So you can see it com you know, go back and forth. If I go all the way to the end, do something like that where it saturates for a moment. Now this saturating behavior is itself normal because when you switch the range, the attenuators are switching, but then you inject a whole bunch of charge and you drop it into that closed loop system that I mentioned. It takes time for that to stabilize. And that's what we are seeing. So, it's going to be fun now. Let's go ahead and connect it to something and measure some actual powers coming from some instruments. So here's a quick test we're going to do using the Rodenschwarz SMBV100B. Now I'm going to do a full review of this later. This is a fantastic synthesizer with some really impressive specification and internal modulation capabilities. Right now we're only going to use it as just a basic synthesizer because of its excellent output accuracy. It's set to 8 kHz, which is its lowest frequency and 10 millivolt. So we're going to see if we can measure 10 millivolt on this. Now keep in mind that the output of this is of course 50 ohms. So I have a series inline 50 ohm resistor over here which terminates this into 50 ohms so that we can actually measure the correct power over here. So the range here is at 10 millivolt RMS at the top you can see over here and right now we're measuring nothing. I'll enable the output and let's see what happens. Let's see if it stabilizes. And there it is. Check it out. I mean, that is really, really good. 9.995 is essentially 10 millivolt RMS. That is well, well within specification. The needle is at full deflection as well. So it looks and works very well. Now, the total output power into 50 ohm is minus 27 dBm, which is, of course, correct. And this is now a full scale input. Now, if I increase that just a little bit, we should be able to hit an overload condition. There it is. You can see we're now in overload condition. That was 11 millivolt. You can go all the way down to 5 here. Wait for it to stabilize. There you go. Reading 5. Really, really good. Let's go down to 1 millivolt, which would be a 10% deflection. That essentially brings the needle just below, just right around that corner. Anything below this is really not valid. And we're reading almost 1 millivolt. So the specification of this is always mentioned with respect to full scale and this is well within the specification of this unit as well and you can see it's reading quite nicely and the trend from where we overloaded it and we were at the maximum can easily be seen above. So let me disable the output over here and go to the lowest range. The lowest range is 1 millivolt RMS so which is what it is right now. I'm going to turn that on. So now we expect full deflection again of the needle and we should be reading 1 millivolt RMS. Look at that. That is beautiful. A thousand volts RMS. This is now minus 47 dBm into 50 ohms. I can ch lower that as well to a hundred microvolt RMS which is the lowest this instrument should be able to read somewhat reliably. And look at that. That is great. 108 it's reading a little bit high which is normal. This is still within specification. I think it's working quite nicely. Now I can also set values in dBm because I, I have the dBm value over here. You can see minus 66.2 dBm and the maximum is minus 47 dBm for this range. So I'm just going to enter minus 50 dBm, which is still a fairly small value. Here's minus 50 dBm. Let's see if it reads that correctly. And there it is. Minus 50 dBm is really quite beautiful. We can also try the trend line, which is going to follow things like AM modulation that are very slow or just, just changes over time. So I have set the Rodenschwarz synthesizer to do an AM modulation, a very, very slow one, about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 hertz or so, but 100% uh, AM depth. So we should be able to see that. Let's go and turn it on. There we go. You can see the needle now move back and forth slowly. And with that, we have a trend line. So you can see the history of that actually over time, which can be very helpful if you want to see something changing and so on. Yeah, I like it. And of course, the colors are going to change because you're constantly moving back and forth through the, the full scale of this thing. It's really quite mesmerizing. We also said that this thing has 20 megahertz of bandwidth. It can integrate power over 20 megahertz, which is quite good. We can try this out right now. So right now we're set to 10 kilohertz, 100 millivolt RMS. We're reading a reasonably good number, very close to where it should be. And we're going to change that from 10 kilohertz to 20 megahertz. There we go, 20 megahertz, and some minor change, but yeah, you can see that it measures perfectly fine, only tiny changes between those across the frequency. So it works, everything is quite good. Now we can use it for some actual experiment.
By the way, you want to see something impressive? Check out what the Rod and Short synthesizer can do. 20 megahertz, look at that. Wait for it to stabilize. <laughs> look at this, it puts out 30 dBm of power. It can actually put out more than that. And it can do modulation at these powers. It's very impressive. We'll see it during the review later. Well, let's measure some dangerous values. This is a GW Instec APS-1102, which I repaired in one of the previous videos. It's set to its highest value. It can go as high as 280 volts RMS, which is what it is set to right now, turned off. And this is set to its highest value, which is 300 volts. Now, keep in mind, I have already removed the 50 ohm resistor. If you do, s do this experiment with the 50 ohm resistor connected over here, it would be a bad time because all that power would have to go somewhere. Right now, I'm running this into high impedance directly connected over there. So let's go ahead and turn it on and see what happens. Here we go. Enable in the output and check it out. Focus over here. So it actually does the focusing. Sorry about the lights. I can see the reflection of the lights in the LCD. Look at that. What are we reading? 280 volts RMS. If this were to be dumped onto a 50 ohm resistor, it would be 61.9 dBm. It would be 1.5 kilowatts. That's why that resistor, of course, cannot be there. But you can see the massive dynamic range of this instrument, and this is 50 hertz. So we were measuring 10 kilohertz, 20 megahertz, 50 hertz, and we can measure things with very uh, unusual crest factors. All of that is great. But what I really wanted to use this for is to measure noise coming from DC-DC converters and other kinds of power supplies. Let's do one last experiment like that. So let's try to measure the noise of this linear technology micromodule DC-DC converter over here. Now you've got to be very careful measuring noise like this because the input impedance of this is, is very high. It's 10 megaohm as we talked about and it's AC coupled. So it's very susceptible to pick ambient noise. And you can see that everything is turned off right now and just from being around it and having cables running around, we're measuring in a 1.3 millivolt RMS background kind of noise from this. It can be cleaned up, but for the purposes of this demonstration, it's okay. So we're going to run this micromodule from 16 volts coming from this key side power supply. We also have this BK Precision DC electronic load, which we can use to pull some current from this device and see what happens to his noise under different conditions. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this on, and then we're going to draw one amp from it. And we're going to focus over here and see how the noise of the DC-DC converter changes under these conditions. All right, first thing first, let's turn on the DC-DC converter. Here we go. Now you're going to get that initial huge overload because you have, you're pushing a DC voltage there. That DC transition is going to inject charge into the device and that's going to stabilize. That's normally what happens in AC coupled circuits anyway. There we go. We're measuring 6.7 volt RMS. And that's the steady state noise coming from the micro module producing a 12 volt output under no load at all. So I'm going to draw one amp from it. Now, Typically, when these DC converters experience a load, they do tend to generate a little bit more noise. And let's see if that's the case or not. You can also see a trend line going across over here. So I'm going to enable it. Three, two, one, now. There you go. You can see there's a minor change. We went to 7.7 .7 millivolt RMS. So indeed, the noise of this does go up. Now, these micromodules are fairly quiet. Uh, relatively speaking, and you know, have to be careful because some of that 7.7 .7 millivolt RMS is actually the ambient background noise, and we can subtract that. But it's fairly, fairly uh, good representation of what happens with these DC-DC converters when you put them under load. Now, of course, the nice thing is that this could have been a 600 volt DC-DC converter. We could have run exactly the same test again. Now, in that situation, you have to be really careful. You have to start from the highest range when you turn it on so that the charge injected is not too high, and then you slowly back away into the smaller and smaller values once the setup has been stabilized. But hopefully this gives you a good idea of how useful this is. There's going to be also some crest factor experiments we can do with this. I'll save that for next time in the interest of time, but hopefully you can appreciate why I went through the trouble of doing this upgrade. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video too. I wanted to take you through kind of a thought process of a project here at the Signal Pad. This is a request coming from my Patreon supporters who wanted to see kind of a project from end to end. So this is an example of that. Please do take a moment, take a look at the Patreon page and see if this is something you want to be a part of. Of course, all my videos are available for free. All the content is always available for free. The Patreon supporters just want to help the channel and of course help everybody else benefit from what we can do here. I have a whole bunch of repairs and a bunch of reviews all lined up. Hopefully you going to find those enjoyable as well. I'll see you next time.